I just accidentally, instead of sharing screen, I turned off the, uh, oh well. Sharing, sharing. Oh, uh, sharing options here. Let's go to sharing the screen. Acts, at the end of uh, Acts 13, yeah, I wrote a note to myself there that this is in Pisidian Antioch. Uh, that will help me remember where we are. So they were in the synagogue in Pisidian Antioch, and the Jews disagreed with, uh, or at least most of the Jews disagreed with what Paul was saying, and they rejected the message. So they're in... Uh, Verse 46, Paul and Barnabas answered them boldly, we had to speak the word of God to you first, since you reject it and do not consider yourselves worthy of eternal life, we now turn to the Gentiles uh, because they'll be willing to listen. Uh, 47, for this is what the Lord has commanded us. I made you a light for the Gentiles that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. And I include there the NIV footnote that these are, uh, the U is singular, and the Hebrew is singular as well. And so a question might arise as to how can the apostles say that this is what the Lord has commanded us when he has commanded it to a one person? And it is because Jesus has taken this commission and made it his own, and then and he has re, they are acting as his agents, his apostles, serving his mission, so it's still part of his mission, his, uh, his mission to bring salvation to the ends of the earth, he's just that he's using them in order to do it. So in the, verse 48, when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and honored the word of the Lord, you know, they were receiving it with appreciation. And all who were appointed for eternal life believed. Now this word, this verse, uh, can be a difficult scripture for those who do not believe in predestination, because this is one of the key verses that, you know, those who teach predestination also use. All who were appointed for eternal life believe. So there's a, so they will use that. And so, you know, those who don't believe in predestination, which includes myself, uh, uh, would, would then say, oh, this is, uh, is, we have to have a, another explanation for this. Now, there are lots of other verses that are also involved in the mix. And so this is not the, you know, the, the only thing we have to go on. But there is, we do need to look at, see, what, what does it mean to be appointed for eternal life? And there is one clue for that in Acts 22.10, where part of Paul's uh, mission is that he was appointed to take the gospel to the Gentiles. And he was, uh, he was told to go to Ananias, and there he would be told everything he was appointed to do. Well, it doesn't mean everything that he was predestined to do, because that would be, you know, that would be volumes it would take uh, 10 years to describe to him all the things that he was predestined to do if God had predestined all of it. Uh, so it cannot, it cannot mean that, he, that these, he was to be told everything that he was predestined for, but he was assigned this job. Whether or not he did everything he was assigned to do, that's up to him. Uh, so the, the, the word appointed does not necessarily mean a, an ironclad uh, locked into it. This is actually going to happen. Uh, so in this ver verse back in Acts 13, we can say all who were appointed for eternal life believe. There we can say that the, these people were uh, created for the purpose of, et of uh, eternal life. But then that brings then a different problem in that it implies that some people were not so appointed. They were not uh, given the assignment, as it were, to believe and have eternal life. Uh, 
So that's a difficult, I, re I recognize that as a difficulty. One way to deal with it might be to say that it, God has not uh, preordained when they were to believe, but that they can still believe at some uh, later time, maybe not when Paul is preaching to them right there, but the, the door is not permanently closed. Uh, we cannot prove that from this verse. Uh, it just remains a possibility. And then when we look at the subject of predestination from these other verses, then we can say, well, uh, in Acts 13, 48, we have two possible interpretations. One of them is going to contradict with these verses over here, and the other, well, has a different uh, explanation, perhaps is okay. So we choose the one that doesn't contradict the others. And that's kind of a, a short explanation. Uh, maybe it's kind of like hunting the ball. Uh, we're, we're saying, well, we don't have enough information to resolve the question right here. It would take, you know, there are thick books discussing this concept of a predestination. And so we cannot uh, deal with it all here. But I at least thought I should mention that aspect of this verse. That it's, I'm, I'm not completely comfortable with the way any interpretation deals with this particular verse or this idea of what Luke says talks about those who were appointed for eternal life. There are some ways to get around one aspect of it, but not another. But we can go on to word, uh, verse 49. The word of the Lord spread through the whole region. This is another Luke summary statement. Uh, things, you know, things are getting positive progress for the gospel. Verse 50, but the Jewish leaders incited the God-fearing women of high standard standing and the leading men of the city. So there are two categories of people here, God-fearing women of high standing and leading men of the city who presumably weren't God-fearing. Uh, so some of the, the women were attending the synagogue services, were in favor of Judaism. And I think if I were a woman, I think I would favor Judaism too because of the license, sexual license that uh, paganism had. Uh, it's, uh, they, they did not allow women to have sexual license, but they allowed men to have it. Uh, so, I, and I think historically, women were more likely to be proselytes to Judaism than the men were, partly because circumcision would put off the men, but I think partly because the Jewish uh, morals also appealed to the women better. So there were, there were some high-standing women who were attended the synagogue, and so the Jewish leaders would have known who they were and would have had good rapport with them, would have some influence with them. And perhaps through these high-standing women, they also reached, was able to have some influence with their husbands, the leading men of the city. That's a bit of conjecture, but it kind of might say what, why Luke is mentioning these two particular groups, why they are involved in uh, the Jewish persecution of Paul. These God-fearing women, leading men of the city, stirred up persecution against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them from the region. Get out of here. Uh, so Paul and Barnabas shook the dust off their feet. Uh, that was uh, Jewish. Uh, Jesus talked about, told his disciples, that when they reject you in one city, you know, shake the dust off your feet. This was apparently a Jewish custom in which they were treating the, even the dust of the city as unclean. They wanted to, to get rid of it, shake it off. Uh, but it was a, uh, some kind of gesture of, uh, we're not going to have anything to do with you. So they went to Iconium. Uh, and here I wanted to look at a little uh, a map to show where this, this was. We, this is the nation of Turkey now, and Antioch of Pisidia is pretty well in the middle. 
Uh, let's see if I can. A little boxer in that so you can make sure that you can see where I'm talking about. That's, and that's that's where they had been. At, that is where they were. The city they were asked to leave. So they go from there down to Iconium, moving the box instead of making a new one. So they go to Iconium, which is about 50 miles away. It's, so that's more than one day's journey, but it's, it was the next city they went to, and they were able to have a ministry in that area. And you can get a little uh, glimpse ahead of time of where they'll be going after Iconium to Lystra, and then over to Derby, and then back retracing the steps. So they're still in the mountainous area of Turkey, uh, and Iconium is more of a, a, a less, not as big a city, but it still has uh, a Jewish, uh, a Jewish presence. And, uh, and here, verse 52, the disciples were filled with joy and the Holy Spirit. Another Luke summary statement. Oh, Janet says, you didn't see a map. Interesting map at all. I wonder why that is. Hmm. Okay. Well, good. I know one way to do it, and that's to start sharing the screen again. So let's try this. All right. I guess you see a map now. All right. So this is Antioch in Central Day, and they travel south a little bit in the city of Iconium, still in the interior area. You can see where, where they'll be going from there. So let's stop that one and start another. Go back to the text. So verse 52, the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. 14, Luke describes the message in, at Iconium. There, Paul and Barnabas went, as usual, into the Jewish synagogue. There was uh, the city large enough to have a Jewish population and synagogue. They, there they spoke so effectively that a great number of Jews and Greeks believed. Now here I think it's interesting that Luke describes this as the, not that the Jews and Greeks believed because they were appointed, because God had decided ahead of time that they would believe, but because Paul and Barnabas spoke effectively. So there is a role there for the work that the people are doing. Uh, Luke is attributing part of the success to Paul and Barnabas' uh, speaking ability, His book, which, of course, is inspired by the Spirit. Uh, but they spoke so effectively that a great number of Jews and Greeks believed. But nevertheless, verse 2, the Jews who refused to believe stirred up the other Gentiles. Interesting that the Jews even had influence with the other Gentiles and poisoned their minds against the brothers. You know, saying slanderous words like, you know, they're, they're just traveling hucksters trying to uh, Gain a following with some wacky idea. Uh, <clears throat> but the Jews would feel threatened by Paul's message. If people start following Paul instead of uh, the Jewish synagogue leaders, you know, they're losing influence. Uh, and they're also, you know, they can have religious uh, concerns as well. You know, here they, they are. Uh, they have fallen, uh, failing in their duty to help the flock stay faithful to God, try to protect the sheep as, the, as best they know how. Uh, but they do it uh, with a bit of uh, underhanded uh, violence. Uh, but anyway, it's, there was a controversy. Nevertheless, Paul, verse 3, Paul and Barnabas spent considerable time there speaking boldly for the Lord, who could 
messages of grace by enabling them to perform signs and wonders. So they have a ministry of some length there. And verse 4, the people of the city were divided. And this is a theme we see throughout Acts, that this message produces division. Some people believe it, some people don't. And the opinions are very strong. Uh, they so some people sided with the Jews, uh, meaning the majority, I guess, and others with the apostles. Uh, this is one place where Luke calls Paul and Barnabas apostles. Uh, Paul calls himself an apostle and also calls Barnabas an apostle in one of his epistles. But this is the only place that Luke uh, and some have tried to uh, read into that. that. Well, Luke didn't really think they were apostles and this somehow got into his text. Uh, but there's no need. Need, no need for that. Luke is flexible enough in his terminology, even though he defined apostle earlier in the book as those who had been with Jesus from the beginning and were there throughout his ministry. Luke is able to expand his understanding of words and uh, that, uh, some development of the idea. Uh, critics are sometimes too critical. Verse 5, there is a plot afoot among both Gentiles and Jews, together with their leaders, to mistreat them and stone them. Stoning was typically a Jewish uh, method of execution. So apparently the Jews had influence and in they were going about persecuting Paul and Barnabas. Uh, Verse 6, they found out about it and fled to the Lacaonian cities of Lystra and Derby and the surrounding country. And they didn't just say it weren't only in the cities, but in the surrounding country. Luke doesn't tell us what they did in the surrounding country. He just focuses on Lystra and Derby. But the ministry was bigger than what Luke has space to report. Verse 7, and they continued to preach the gospel in their cities. And then starting in verse 8, he will uh, describe Paul's ministry in Lystra. So that's a stopping point. Any uh, comments or questions there? No? All right. Go back to Lystra. Lystra, verse 8. In Lystra there sat a man who was lame. He had been that way from birth and had never walked. So parts of this story, this is a miracle story, kind of fits into a format of the first thing they do in a miracle story is to describe the problem and then the solution and then the reaction. And there are similarities with this story with what Peter did in the temple, Acts 3. Uh, there's a man who is lame there from birth. Walked. He listened to Paul as he was speaking. Looked directly at him, just as Peter had looked directly at the man at the temple. He had the faith to be healed. Paul called out, stand up on your feet. The man jumped up and began to walk. This man at the temple jumped up. And this is a dramatic healing of uh, a man who had been lame for so long. And it was apparently quite impressive. And so the crowd, verse 11, when the crowd saw what Paul had done, they shouted in the Lacaonian language. Paul and Barnabas didn't at first know what was going on because they don't speak Lacaonian. But they were shouting out, the gods have come down to us in human form. Barnabas they called Zeus, and Paul they called Hermes because he was the chief speaker. Zeus had, was the uh, head of the, all the gods, 
Hermes was the spokesperson. So they called Paul Hermes because he was doing most of the speaking. Uh, the other guy was, uh, seemed to, I, I doubt that Barnabas seemed to be in charge, but that's the kind of assignment. I need to cough, so I'll mute my website. I can't mute it unless I stop sharing. Now, this, and this goes back to a story that circulated in Asia Minor where Zeus and Hermes had come down to this city incognito as, human, as, as humans, and everybody ignored them, uh, you know, rejected them, wouldn't give them a place to stay, except for some elderly couple named Philemon and Bacchus. Philemon, of course, we know it was a name later used uh, by a Christian. But this is a, a story about the pagan gods. So this, this couple were kind and received uh, the incognito Zeus and Hermes. And they got angry at the town, and I forget what they did to it. And they, they turned the Eliman Bacchus, uh, the, the little humble home, they turned it into a grandiose temple. But anyway, it was kind of a, a shame on the city for not recognizing the gods who had come to visit them. So it seems that in this story, they are determined to make up for their mistake. They, okay, we're not going to make the same mistake again. This time we are going to recognize Zeus and Hermes. And, uh, and then, so in verse uh, 13 here, Zeus, whose temple was just outside the city, brought bulls and wreaths to the city gates because he, the crowd, wanted to offer sacrifices to the <laughs> uh, So then, verse 14, when they finally figured out what was going on, apostles Barnabas and Paul, interesting Barnabas is mentioned there first. Uh, her, I just noticed that. <laughs> Uh, they, they tore their clothes, rushed out into the crowd, shouting in Greek, I guess, Friends, why are you doing this? We too are only human like you. We're bringing you good news. So here, the, this, is their, this is their speech, their gospel presentation, uh, in a hurry, as it were, so that they can stop this sacrifice. Uh, they tore their clothes as an, an expression of, uh, you know, you, you, you guys are blaspheming, calling these humans gods. Uh, don't do this. Uh, get their attention. Friends, why are you doing this? We are human, human like you. We are bringing you good news you know, to turn from these worthless things, these gods that you talk about, to the living God who made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. So then this is a common Jewish message given to the pagans. Uh, their idols are worthless things. That uh, was a common term that the uh, Jewish apologists use. Uh, that the fact that he is uh, the creator of all. Uh, and verse 16, in the past, he let all nations go their own way. Uh, Paul says something similar in Romans 1. He just them over to do what they wanted to do. But verse 17, he has not left himself without testimony. Uh, the creation in some way point us to a creator. Uh, he has shown kindness, uh, verse 17 still, he has shown kindness by giving you rain from heaven, crops in their seasons. He provides you with plenty of food fills your hearts with joy. So even our, our joy of a pagan comes from God. Jesus said something similar. God makes the rain fall on the good and the evil. Both. Uh, God is generous in uh, his use of nature to help his people. Now, nature can also be pretty 
uh, wicked. <laughs> we don't blame God for that. But just the fact that nature works at all, that the universe is sustained, that there is an ecosystem that allows us to have food, uh, rain, food, and joy. Uh, it all comes from God, he says. Even with these words, they had difficulty keeping the crowd from sacrificing to them. The crowd may not have understood Greek as well as he wanted them to, uh, but he was trying to make, you know, they, they wanted to make sure they didn't make this mistake again with uh, nubbing the gods. So, and Paul was saying, no, you know, don't do it. They're not gods. Verse 19, then some Jews came from Antioch and Iconium. The Jews are really concerned to follow up on Paul, or to try to counteract this message that he is preaching. They somehow figured out where he had gone, uh, and to make sure that the synagogue in Lystra uh, were, you know, not going to be infected. Uh, I don't know, yeah, this list, of, there may not have been a synagogue there even, but it's, uh, there were apparently some Jews. Because when Paul goes back there, he speaks to them. Uh, so the Jewish people, Jewish leaders, were trying to follow up on Paul, dogging his heels. Uh, so they stoned Paul. They carried out what they had planned to do earlier and dragged him outside the city, thinking he was dead. Uh, and apparently, he wasn't. Sometimes we think, well, maybe this is a miracle of him being raised from the dead. But Paul, uh, but Luke is saying, uh, implying that he wasn't really dead. They just thought he was dead. Maybe the you know, first stone and knocked him unconscious and went from there. But he was still, it was a, a, a marvelous recovery. Uh, Luke doesn't say it was a miracle, but it was notable recovery for somebody going from, they thought he was dead, they stoned him, uh, and he gets up, and the next day he leaves the city. So he's able to walk out of there. Uh, I don't know whether any bones got broken, uh, but this is God's superintendence of what's going on. I think if I may... Sure. Yeah, doesn't have to die, I guess, to have God intervene. He, <laughs> that's right. The fact itself that he was stoned, oh, and then falling unconscious and still be alive, uh, that is an intervention. I think, uh, I think it happens to us, even us. You know, we've had many miracles uh, in the past. Even though we didn't die, God healed heal us. You know? uh, so it's kind of uh, interesting. What I find interesting too, if I can go back to verse, to verse 17, um, where he says that God has not left you any, you know, testimony and the testimony of God is he did this for you, you know, all this rain and all of that. Um, I think that is a good message that shows that, that God is involved, you know, in verse 17. Uh, the crops of their season, plenty of all of these blessings, it's from the Lord. No, no matter how, no matter how the pagans or Gentiles think about it, from our perspective, it's still God who does it. And then we can use that as, you know, really a message that it is actually from the Lord, from Jesus, uh, what yeah. God is doing. Um, you know, there, because in reality, there is only one God. <laughs> All the others are fake. You know, there's no other God. It's only one. <laughs> and he does bless people even though they are not Christians. Right. I was thinking too that you know, the mirror, uh, God's superintendence of Paul's health, as it were, the miracle could also happen in causing the persecutors to think that he was dead. Uh, 
that it could have an invisible miracle in their minds. There, there, there are many different ways for God to achieve the same purpose. Yes. 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 God enabled him to bear it. Yes, that, that's right. Purpose, and he used it, yes, in both directions, yes. All right, and then, uh, so verse 20, after the disciples had gotten up, gathered around him, he went into the city uh, where, where they wanted to stone him. Uh, well, you know, maybe that was the best place to sleep for the night. But anyway, or he had friend, he had enough friends there to help him out. And he and Barnabas left for Derby. And he was 55 miles further along the road. So that's at least a journey. Uh, they're traveling on foot. Now, Luke doesn't tell us much about what happened in Derby. Uh, they preached at verse 21. They preached the gospel in that city and won a large number of disciples. Luke doesn't tell us whether there's controversy or any of those details. Uh, after winning a large number of disciples, they returned to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch. There I wanted to look at the map again. And let's see, all right, here, if they were in Derby, they had gone overland back to Tarsus, down the water, or back to Antioch, overland. They could have done that quite easily. But instead of going overland, the shortest route, they went backwards so that they could visit the cities that they had been in before. They didn't just Church and then abandon it to itself permanently. They wanted, they felt a responsibility to go back and see how people were doing in the area. So they, you know, okay, here they, they then they return to Lystra and I, Iconium and Antioch, strengthening the disciples, urging them to remain true to the faith, build them up. How long it that took, we don't know. Uh, and then they uh, said, we must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God. And although that doesn't, that looks like we are required to have hardships. To God. Like this is a requirement. Uh, but that, I think, is reading to the sentence too literally. Uh, it's just that hardships happen, uh, and we have to go through them in order to enter the kingdom of God. As, as uh, Lee said, uh, God gave Paul the strength to endure this. He went through it. And he also can then go through our hardships. We don't give up whenever hardships uh, arise like in the, the parable of the sower and the seeds, one of the soils that found on Jesus said, when troubles of this world rise up and choke the word, you know, they, they give up, they go off somewhere else. But Paul says here in this verse, we must go through these hardships to enter the kingdom of God. Kind of not a, referring not just to himself, but also to uh, any of us. And hard, when hardships happen, you know, they seem to, for most people anyway, a few people, Christians seem to sail through with no troubles at all. But most of us have some kind of hardships somewhere along the line. And we go through them to enter the kingdom of God. Verse 23, Paul and Barnabas appointed elders for them in each church. Uh, and there, this is the, there were elders in the Jerusalem church, but some, uh, some are kind of suspicious that Paul is organizing his churches with elders so early in the missionary plan. 
they, they liked the idea that these churches were just uh, groups of equals, uh, kind of uh, charismatic, uh, with no organization, just spirit led. Uh, but I think here that this verse is saying, no, there was some organization. Just as synagogues had organization, it wouldn't take much difficulty for Paul to realize that, hey, somebody needs to coordinate what's going on here. Uh, where, 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 you, where and when you meet, for example. Uh, somebody to uh, serve as the place of, you know, the person of communication, the contact person. If they're going to send a letter to the city, who's going to get it? Who do they send it to? So there's a practical need for somebody to be in charge. So Paul and Parmas appointed elders. They wouldn't have had to use that particular term. Luke might be using a, a term that was in use in his day uh, to refer to these leaders. Uh, but anyway, Paul they appointed some kind of leaders. We can call them elders today. Uh, and they appointed in each church and with prayer and fasting committed these leaders to the Lord, the Lord in whom they had put their trust. They were all trusting the Lord. Verse 24, after going through Pisidia, uh, they came into Pamphylia, a different province. So they had reached the first church that they had planted in Asia, you know, the, the big subcontinent of Asia there. And then they came into Pamphylia, and when they had preached the word in Perga, which when they first arrived there, they just passed through Perga. That was the seaport. They just landed there and then moved on quickly. This time they stopped to preach the word in Perga and went down to Atalia, which is the seaport city, uh, smaller than Perga, but kind of next door cities. From Atalia, they sailed back to Antioch. So they just took one of the normal uh, ocean vessels that traveled along the coast there. It was easier than walking. Uh, not and not necessarily more dangerous. Uh, there were sometimes storms. It would depend on the time of year. But uh, ships sometimes sank. But uh, overland travelers also faced dangers from robbers and that sort of thing. So it's they were simply going back to Antioch in all of the best way they knew how, uh, where they had been coming in. And they Luke reminds us here as readers. Luke reminds us that Antioch is the place where they had been committed to the grace of God for the work that they had now completed. This is typically called Paul's first missionary journey. Uh, and some scholars debate about describing Paul's ministry in terms of first missionary journey, second missionary journey, third missionary journey, when some of these seem to blend into one another, or he would go to Ephesus and spend 18 months there. Well, was he on a journey or not? Uh, his ministry was flexible. It wasn't not, not always neatly uh, packaged into a missionary journey. It happened to be, uh, in, in this case, there is a fairly good starting point and then an ending point as they come back to Antioch and as it says there in verse 28, they stayed there a long time with the disciples. It's not like they had come home and intended to stay there. Uh, we don't know what was in their mind. But after a while, Paul did leave again. It's like this commission he had been given uh, by Jesus and then by the church at Antioch was still with him. He still had this desire to spread the word, to te preach Jesus where he has not been preached before. And so he would pick up that commission and go forth on future journeys too. But at this point, they, were, they go back to Antioch, they give their report, and they all, verse 27, they gathered the church together, reported all that God had done through them, and how he had opened a door of faith to the Gentiles. Yes. 
there were already Gentiles in the church at Antioch. And the door, in some ways, it was already open with Peter uh, and with those Gentiles in Antioch. But now this is kind of like a, a new circumstance. There are now churches in, say, Perga uh, or Lystra that are primarily Gentile. They're not just coming into a Jewish group, becoming part of a synagogue, as it were, a Messianic synagogue. But it is a church of the Gentiles. But this is kind of, uh, this door was kind of a, a slightly ajar before, and now it is opening up to become wide open. And this bothered, <laughs> bothered some people, especially some in Jerusalem. And that will bring us into Acts 15. And although my document here doesn't have Acts 15 in it, uh, I can start there uh, if, if uh, I can yeah, start in there today, if that's what you'd like for me to do. Otherwise, we can just talk about Acts 14. Any other comments or uh, uh, questions about what went on in Acts 14? Um, I find it wonderful to, to just read about how um, they preached, as you say, effectively and boldly. And my mind wants to know, well, you know what were they saying so that, so that signs and wonders followed. And, yeah. and, and after all of this, they go back. They go back to, to the church in Antioch and they, they give God the glory for all that had been done, all the signs, all, everything, and, and even the building of the churches, or establishing, I should say, of the churches. And um, it's just, it's a glorious chapter to see how disciples uh, in the, the Gentile, the Gentiles are being added to the church of God. And by powerful uh, feelings and signs and wonder. And my mind wants to think, can that, that should be happening today? Help us to preach effectively, like Paul. <laughs> yeah, we'd, we'd like to know what those signs and wonders were, too. Yes, yes. <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned it. I, I, had, pl I, I had planned to uh, mention yeah, these signs and wonders. But yeah, we, we don't know what they were. Luke is, tells us what some, you know, previously he told us, described some of those signs and wonders and miracles that had happened. And there, he's just giving us summary statements now. Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, here is Paul, an apostle, and he's doing a lot of work for the Lord Jesus. And uh, when Christ came, he trained his 12 disciples. I always thought about it. And now they're all very quiet now. We don't even hear anything about them. Yet Christ spent most of his earthly ministry with the disciples. And he didn't even predict that there's going to be a Paul that's coming up. Mm -hmm. Right? Um, yet Paul's role is so huge. He wrote all these epistles. And uh, Thomas, all the others except a few. Matthew, you know, and John, uh, they wrote the book. But uh, so, sometimes that's just in my mind. I, I wonder why Jesus was quite about the type of Paul. He didn't kind of introduce him. Uh, even the relationship of Paul with Jesus, where some people say, oh, he probably was trained with Jesus, you know, for three years in Arabia. But that's still not as clear as Jesus training the disciples for three years. Yeah, a mystery to me. Just. Yeah, the, the, the training the uh, 12 apostles got was different. And that they saw a human, you know, a, a real physically you know, ordinary body, a human Jesus. Uh, and were with him for so long. Of course, they didn't understand everything, but at least they were with him. They saw a lot of, a lot of things. Mm. And as, as you say, uh, Jesus did not predict that someone else would come along that appearing to be greater than the 
world, <laughs> or at least equal to them. Uh, that, that was there too. Even though the, the Great Commission does say, you know, teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. So, you know, he's kind of passing it along. You know, I've, so I've sent you, you are also to teach them that they are to be sent. It, it, it does get uh, passed on. Jesus didn't spell out all the details, no. Oh, man, there's so many details that... Uh, the people of his day couldn't even understand, you know, the, the, the fact that there are continents on the other side of the world uh, with peoples. Uh, yeah, who knows? <laughs> I think that's, that's a good point there, Mike, where we don't even know what Jesus is doing with a lot of people in different parts of the world doing uh, apostle-like work and ministry some even dying for the work for Jesus and they are unknown but they are doing mightily than those who are very popular probably in the states they have their own televised mm. networks you know right. um, so I mean Jesus works in many mysterious ways and they are never less you know, it's still Jesus who does the work whether he does it through a person who is unknown or one mm. who is a celebrity <laughs> <laughs> You know, wouldn't wouldn't Jesus have had is, if he right? had if he had told them about Paul? Wouldn't he have had to mention some of the experiences that they would be having that he didn't bring up at that time? <laughs> Maybe so. <laughs> oh, oh, the the places you will go. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> the things the things I could tell. <laughs> <laughs> it it might be too much for you to bear. <laughs> Yes. Oh, we, we do not know what the Lord has in store for us. His ways are not our ways. <laughs> no. No, no. Uh, uh, my question, Pastor Mark, is uh, were the uh, 12 apostles, did they recognize or was he recognized on all? Of, did they recognize him as an apostle at the same office to the Gentiles or? They were not sure, or was there any mention in the Bible? Because he mentioned he was an apostle, apostle Paul. But I know there were, you know, some controversies in the church. So was he self-proclaiming himself, or was there an agreement? Yes, apostle Paul is an apostle, or were, were, was there no formal announcement? Maybe in, the, in that time. Yeah, they, they agreed that uh, Paul would go to the Gentiles and they would go to the Jews. I don't think they discussed what title uh, you know they have. I don't, I don't think of any uh, uh, place in their writings where they call Paul an apostle. Peter does say that you know, there are some things that uh, Paul wrote that are hard to, hard to understand, and some people twist them as they do the other scriptures. But he viewed Paul's writings as equivalent to the other scriptures. Uh, that's a pretty kind of a high recommendation, uh, acknowledgement of Paul's uh, authority that he wrote some of the scriptures. Yeah, I marvel at uh, Paul's understanding and his depth of his theology where he said that I didn't even get this from the apostles. You know, I got it from the Lord. And then, he, you know, to say that he got it also from his study of the Old Testament, it's still, you know, a lot of the things he has in, I mean, he taught are so much deeper than just the Old Testament teaching, especially his understanding of grace, you know. Um, so that, I mean, that to me is a really a miracle that God worked with him uh, I mean, the guy is just amazing. I mean, to, uh, for us now, we go to a seminary to study so many, many years and still don't get it much. But Paul is amazing. He has all this. And when, he re when we read his writings like Ephesians, every word, every verse is so, so there's a gold nugget in it. Just, <laughs> yeah. yeah, he was certainly a, a phenomenal 
thinker and writer uh, and yeah, influential. Uh, it was a, definitely a, a blessing for the work of the church. And if uh, you know, the, he was instrumental in expanding this mission to the Gentiles, and you know, if it hadn't been for him, uh, it might have dragged on for a, long, a lot longer than it did. Uh, it may have taken much longer for the church to uh, welcome Gentiles. Mike, do you think the Gentiles are the ones that helped them lead the city from being stoned and these ship rides they were taking? Was it, do you think it's Jewish people or do you think it's the Gentiles helping them? Because they split it. Yeah, that, that's, that's a good question. Uh, you seem to have had some friends in both categories mm -hmm. uh, and, well, and enemies in both categories, but it seems to be primarily at the instigation of the Jews who, who influenced the uh, pagan authorities to persecute Paul. Right. You know, if, if, if I were, you know, if I were to guess, if it's only one category of friend who helped Paul, I would guess it was the Gentiles. I would think so too. And, and that the, the Jewish, his Jewish friends might have been a bit intimidated by the Jewish leaders. Uh, you know, that's, because there was, you know, as Paul knew well, there were a lot, you know, Jewish to Jewish animosities going mm -hmm. there. And they didn't always treat each other nicely. Uh, whereas Gentiles, maybe, yeah. It's, Luke doesn't tell us, but yeah, that's a, a interesting question. Yes. So you would think the Gentiles were the ones that took them in at night, fed them, and then let them go on their own from there. Yeah, could be. Yeah. You wouldn't assume they had the money. Well, yeah, some of the, the leading uh, leading Gentiles live, but it, it doesn't take, it's, Paul doesn't take a lot of space. Even a small house could give him a, a place to sleep. <laughs> That's true, people are small. People were used to that kind of uh, uh, humble uh, lodging. <laughs> hmm. Yeah, anybody else? Oh, I, uh, on the chat, I just asked a question. Uh, when Paul oh. was being stoned, where was Barnabas? Ah, yes. I <laughs> actually, I, I, I did write that down on my yellow pad. <laughs> I forgot about it. <laughs> Why didn't they stone Barnabas too? I don't know. <laughs> he was running. <laughs> and how the bear theory goes. Bear yeah, gets you a, 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 <laughs> yeah, yeah, the better it is. <laughs> and you mentioned Paul is the is the speaker. He's the spokesman. Yeah. So the fire and the anger is against the one who speaks. And probably Barnabas has the countenance of Zeus. Maybe he looks so. Uh, fatherly and so you know and then just quiet yeah. maybe and, and it could be that the jews who had stirred up the trouble uh, identified paul as the as the the chief troublemaker uh that's but yeah what was barnabas doing in the meantime was was he <laughs> was he trying to stop, stop it stop it <laughs> I, I don't know <laughs> oh, yeah. He's a nice person the by by personality the scripture to seem to say he has a kind persona, a kind one. Yeah, so that's right. Many people may not agree with your belief, but if you show a persona of kindness and love, they won't touch you. But Paul was more fierce, I guess. More <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We're trying to put more flesh onto these personalities. <laughs> Barbara, I say something. Yes, Barbara. Paul's reputation went before him as well. So he was a target. He was the one they looked to as the one in authority. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That was probably it, too. <laughs> but still, what was Barnabas doing? <laughs> That's a good question. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Luke just doesn't tell, tell us all these things. We'd like to know. Yeah. Thank you. 
All right. Well, thank you all. Uh, and thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Interesting. And we'll see you again next week. Thank you. God bless. See you right. Sunday. See you Sunday. All right. Good night. Bye. -bye. Good night. Good night.